very proud East Belfast man. I, I want to hand over to an East Belfast woman in New York, Susanna Aquino, who's a wonderful ambassador for Belfast, uh, she and her husband, Joe, and she's going to introduce the next session. So, Suzanne, good morning. Okay. Thank you, Martine. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and Martine, I have to say, it's another beautiful day here in New York City. I was so looking forward to an in-person tour with Rob Walsh, but um, I will definitely join for the virtual tour. So I would like to get started and kick off this um, wonderful panel about rebuilding the battered cities, um, both of New York and of Belfast. And I'm going to kick it off. I'm going to start with um, Bill. And Bill, if you can tell us some of the key strategies and considerations that the New York Forward Reopening Advisory Board are discussing with Governor Cuomo that will help to not only rebuild, but to restore New York City. As I mentioned earlier, before we got started, I, I know I left Belfast, but I come to New York, a wonderful city. I miss everything about it, the people, the crowds, the hustle and bustle. But every day I tune into Governor Cuomo's updates. So Bill, can you tell us what, what you've been advising? Certainly, Suzanne. So first of all, uh... A pleasure to be here, uh, and uh, it's an honor to, to be part of the, of the conference. The governor appointed me, God, almost three months ago when we were in the midst of the health care crisis uh, to start thinking at that point about how we would reopen the economy. And let me just put things in a little bit of perspective. New York, our first COVID case in New York was, was March 1st, 104 days ago. We were probably hit harder than any city for sure in, New in this country and, and, and harder hit as a state than any uh, state in the country. At one point, we had a high of 799 deaths in one day. So now in just 104 days, uh, we've met the healthcare crisis. Our deaths are under 40 at this point. Our infection rate is under 1%, which is the lowest rate of transmission in the entire country. So the governor's given enormously great leadership in getting New Yorkers to understand the severity of the crisis and, and to meet the challenge. So now the next challenge, obviously, is how we reopen the economy and how we get New York back to be in New York. And let me you know, say to all of you, New York is back. It's getting back. The entire state is open at this point. We have done it in a phased approach. And so we've done it based on science, based on data, and while the rest of the country, unfortunately, is seeing an increase in the infection rate, we in New York, even as we are open, our infection rate still goes down. So we're focused at this point on two things, Suzanne, to get the economy back specifically. One, since 70% of our uh, economic input is, comes from the consumer, we're very focused on getting people back to work safely. So that's, we've done a, a, a very extensive set of protocols to get people back into their office buildings, to get people feeling safe on public transit. We now disinfect every subway train every night. And we do the same with restaurant protocols and everything that we do is try to make sure our citizens and the consumer feels that they are safe. So that's priority number one. The other thing we're doing to bring New York back is on the job creation side. We're doing a lot of work on infrastructure. So when folks are able to come back to New York, you'll see that we have a brand new airport at LaGuardia. So we were able to, to increase the infrastructure and the construction. We're doing the same right now at JFK. We're, we're putting money into uh, Penn Station, which is the largest transit hub in, in the Western Hemisphere. So we're creating jobs by putting people to work on the infrastructure and ironically with less people on the roads we've been able to get that done quicker so so let me tell you new york is coming back we will be open completely in new york city probably within the next 30 days we'll look forward at some point to uh, welcome you all back to new york to get there to see broadway and and to uh to visit all of our good restaurants and pubs and and so uh we're, we're very focused on it Thank you, Bill. I appreciate that. It's great to hear. Um, I'm going to jump across the pond now, and I'm going to um, talk with Peter. 
um, Peter Boyle, founder and CEO of Argento. So, Peter, I read a very heartwarming story that based on your entrepreneurial instincts and inspirational generosity, you were able to fund the retooling of a company, Schnuggle, to provide much needed face shields for the frontline workers. So I would like to ask you, what do you see as an entrepreneur's role in building and rebuilding the city of Belfast? Oh, thank you. Um, first of all, thanks for inviting us along today. I, I wouldn't take full credit for the retooling of uh, Snuggle. Uh, we had come across Snuggle through a recommendation of a friend, and they were already um, trying to do a crowdfunding of the of the piece. And I, like many others, thought, I wonder, is this a, a fake? Is this a, something can be trusted to invest in? Um, I followed up and made a few inquiries, and uh, based on the recommendation of a friend who'd worked with them, we felt that by investing some money and showing that we were willing to put in a substantial amount of money, that we could give them a little bit of momentum and uh, gain them some trust. So we, hopefully all we did was give them a little push, but they were already well on the way t to getting the product. It was an open source product that they had designed, uh, and were, we were able to help them get their prototype out. And it was more about trying to give other people confidence to go ahead and invest in them um, and, to, and to get things moving a little, little there. And so that certainly worked in the... Uh, it's now it, it evolved into a, and it's gone back from a charity thing at the start. Now it's gone off. The companies that were manufacturing it have now taken it on as a as a commercial project to carry on with. So I think the initial need was met in the charity sector and uh, and the shortfalls in the PP supplies to uh, key workers. And so now it's it's evolved into a, a standalone business and, uh, that the the manufacturers are moving. Um, the role of the entrepreneur. I think my my initial reaction to it. Like everybody else was fear, and um, and after that, my instincts were, you know, what can I do? What, how can we get moving? How do, how do we change and adapt? How do we how do we get on and, and uh, try and find something that we can contribute? Uh, and so that was my that was my next sector, you know. So we were like we helped with that. We got the fish shields up and running, and then really then it was quite difficult to get involved in anything. Um, there was a lot of people saying, you know, we can handle this ourselves. So I think the initial wordings around that were saying we need help in uh, the care sectors, et cetera. And so as an entrepreneur who sells jewelry and earrings in this daytime job, uh, you know, we didn't feel that we could help very much. So we, we helped on the snuggle, and then we really started looking at adaptions in our own business where we could adapt our own business. We also run a aqua park, and obviously that's closed. So we've, we opened the first drive in cinema in Northern Ireland. Uh, as soon as that was permitted, uh, we were moving LED screens from China. Uh, large, we have two big LEDs coming in to again run outdoor, a driving conference center and a driving entertainment center. Uh, I mean, and hopefully that's contributing. Uh, we don't know how it'll make a profit or anything, and that's not really why we're doing it. We're doing it to remain active, to try and keep our business relevant, and hopefully provide something to our community that, that maybe needs. Uh, certainly, the first driving cinema was fun. People. You know, you could see that people were just so relieved to get out of their homes in a safe, uh, in a safe way in the cars, and so it seemed like a very small contribution there. But we're continuing to adapt. Our, our stores open today for the first time in uh, 90 days. We've been closed. We opened the first of our stores. Um, we'll see an upscaling of that. We don't know how busy that will be. It'll be a long time before both our staff and customers are feeling safe enough to visit our stores. But it's a first step on a road to recovery. We hope. Okay, that's that's great, um, Pete. I'm going to stay in Belfast and I'm going to bring in um, Paul Maskey, MP Belfast, and I'm going to say, Paul, um, what are you hearing from your constituents, particularly small businesses, and how you help um, for the planning of this reopening that we've heard has just started? Paul, I think you're on mute. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I think you're on, you're on mute, Paul. <laughs> okay. Yes, we hear you now. Yes. Okay, so uh, apologies about that. So I suppose when we're talking to many of the small businesses right across the city, including my own constituency of West Belfast, many of them have had many concerns over through the last number of months because it's been on piece of down the times for them. They're not aware or unsure how they actually dealt with some of these issues. But if I look at even with, with Peter's story, I know even one of the success stories with regards to my own constituency of West Belfast, Kuda Maggie, for example, former Delta Print, regarding the PPE. They knew there was a problem. They, they normally supplied the McDonald's and Kellogg's and other big um, food brands from around the world. But they now 
create and they change some of the machinery. They're now doing four million face phasers per week. So they've changed their business and that's keeping employment in the local area. But I suppose many of the local businesses did step up to the mark because many of them have helped when they've seen that there was a need, they've helped people who were in need. Many people who were shielding weren't allowed to leave their own homes, weren't allowed to go out to go shopping, they weren't allowed even to have contact with their own family members in many occasions. A number of the small businesses stepped up to the mark and ensured that there was help, there was assistance there, and they were working hand in hand with many people from the community sector, including Belfast City Council and others, to try and keep pushing forward and driving forward. But thankfully, they are all allowed to open from today, and I think we will see a great, um, I suppose, a great trust and a great faith in them because where they step up to the mark, and then we, as I suppose, residents and citizens of this city, also have to ensure that we help them. Because one thing that this pandemic it was very, very clear from the very start that we relied on too many countries from around the world to try and assist us. We relied on imports as well. And when you look at the story of Huda Maggie and many others, like Sir Peter and I know other small businesses right throughout Belfast are pulling together and making PPE gear. They're making other stuff as well with regards to helping the society get back to normal. They were always there in the first place. We didn't rely on them. We went to other countries around the world, and don't get me wrong, import and export is very, very important. But the standard of produce that has been produced here in the streets of Belfast and the companies here in Belfast as well has been second to none. And I think what we need to do is we need to start to try to address those issues about giving, making sure that local businesses have that opportunity, certainly to apply for it, but making sure that some of the, the entrepreneurs in our society are listened to. Let's bring them in. Let's hear what their ideas are. Let's see what their concerns are for the future, because I have no doubt that many of the local entrepreneurs that I speak to have much more better ideas than some of the politicians, including myself, because they're the experts in the field. They're the ones who are dealing with it on a day and daily basis. So we need to have more confidence and more trust in them. We need to engage with them more, and we need to see what their ideas are to try to bring forward. Thank you so much, Paul. And with that, I'm going to pivot um, right back across the pond quicker than the speed of light. And I'm going to bring in Congresswoman Kathleen Rice. And Kathleen, I read a recent article in the island now. Kathleen's um, just slightly out of New York City in Long Island. And you talked about your top priority is helping school districts, small businesses, hospitals and nursing homes not only recover from the coronavirus, but also to ensure that we learn from it and become more resilient. So I would like you to share your insights as to how you're helping your constituents to do that. Well, thank you so much for including me in this wonderful panel. Um, I'm, I'm so happy to be here. So uh, very quickly, we, from a congressional standpoint, as a member of Congress, um, we have prioritized three things. Uh, shoring up our hospitals and making sure that they were not only able to have what they needed at the beginning of this pandemic, but making sure that if there is a recurrence in September or October, that we have enough PPE and we have enough healthy frontline first responders to address any recurrence, number one. Number two, helping individuals, 40 million people, over 40 million people, I think it's up to 42 million people in our country file for unemployment benefits. That never has it been that high. Um, so people are out of work and we had to make sure that we got money to people to help them put food on the table. And then the third priority was our small, small, medium sized businesses. We're not so much worried about the big corporations. They can survive. But it's the small mom and pop shops that make up the backbone of every community across the country, not just here in New York State. And so we um, increased unemployment benefits for individuals that will run out on June 30th. And we created the Paycheck Protection Program for small businesses to be able to um, you know, pay their bills, keep their employees, if they could, on the payroll, so that when the uh, restrictions were lifted and they could open business back up, they would be able to hit the ground running. Now, what we've learned is we've fixed some of the, the problems that we have with the PPP. Um, but I can tell you that what people, what I'm concerned about is that we learned from this caught us we, we were not prepared. We all have to be willing to admit that, that we were not prepared. But I will tell you that, you know, through the great leadership of people like Bill Mulroy and, and our governor Cuomo, we're never going to be that unprepared again. And so we are um, ensuring that we make sure, and you know, there's a big issue about supply chain. Like you, I think Paul just mentioned that, you know, we don't ever want to have to rely on any other country for critical 
um, things that we need to get us through crises like this. So these are longer conversations that we have to have. Um, but my hope is that Congress is going to um, keep giving aid to uh, state and localities who have lost trillions of dollars in lost revenue. I'm hoping we're going to be able to work that out, hoping that we're going to be able to address the issue of um, limiting liability for businesses who follow CDC recommendations in bringing people back to work so that they're not sued and they go out of business because someone gets sick. Um, we, have to, we have to put politics aside and use common sense um, listen to our health experts, because we cannot be in a situation where our economy is shut down again. That would just be beyond catastrophic. No, oh, thank you. I completely agree. Thank you, Kathleen. That's very insightful. I, I'm going to go back to Belfast now, and I'm going to speak with Gavin Robinson, MP Belfast. So, Gavin, welcome. And I don't know. I'm hoping that we will probably get back to Belfast in October, and I'm hoping that the homecoming will be on. So if that is the case, what can we expect to see different and better about Belfast now as it starts to reopen and rebuild? Um, well, thanks, Suzanne, and uh, I hope not only that you get to uh, visit Belfast come October, but that uh, we can get back to New York as soon as possible. My uncle's been a resident in, in Manhattan for 50 years now, uh, is in retirement, tells me he still gets out every day for his cigar, but um, obviously <laughs> they have their, their health concerns uh, more generally uh, than, than the cigar. Um, how are we going to see things uh, differently? I mean, society is changing. Obviously, uh, the movement of people is uh, significantly reduced. I don't think um, we have any sense yet what the significant economic impact is going to be whenever we see the end of you know, our job retention scheme, which is quite similar to the employment uh, payment scheme that you have uh, in the US, whenever that starts to ease off, uh, what impact that's going to have today. We see 20% uh, reduction in our um, economy more generally in the United Kingdom, and that's significant in any recessional terms. Um, I think we're going to see much more collaboration from a community perspective. Uh, I think you'll see, hopefully, a, a more uh, relaxed pace of life. Um, how we navigate social distancing, how we ensure whether it's two metres apart, one metre apart, and the impact that has on the uh, on the economy still remains to be seen. Um, but we look forward to seeing you, and we're going to make sure that the welcome's incredibly warm no matter how we socially distance. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that, um, Gavin. Um, I just wanted to, you know, I know we're, we're probably getting a little short on time, but um, I caught the kickoff of the conference and Senator Tim Kennedy had, had asked the question, you know, when will transportation be back to full capacity? And as I sit here and look out on 6th Avenue in Midtown, I, since the start, I'm surprised to see so many cyclists, skateboarders and rollerbladers um, going, up and down, going up and down 6th Avenue, which, you know, is just not, not heard of. Um, so I'd like to bring Bill and Kathleen back in to say, you know, you both touched a little bit on the transportation and, and we hear about what they're doing in the subways in New York. And, and it's vital, the transportation and infrastructure is vital for New York City to bring both workers from the boroughs and from Long Island into Manhattan and vice versa. So maybe if you could just comment on how will the transportation and infrastructure evolve to accommodate the new pandemic city life? Congressman, you want me to start and then you'll? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so public transportation is absolutely critical to how we get back to uh, the new normal of what New York is going to be. And we've spent a lot of time, money, we're disinfecting the, the subways uh, every night, which has never been done. New York has had a subway mm -hmm. system that ran 24 hours a day. We now shut it at night, so we dis disinfect every subway train. We do that. In the subway, we do it on Long Island, where, where Congresswoman Rice is, and we do it in Westchester. So, so we're focused on the cleanliness. We have provided the system with over a million uh, masks. So we know it's hard to socially distance in a subway car, but we know that if we provide masks, it's been proven that that's a good way to keep infection rates low. And, you know, strange things happen when pandemics occur, and people are on bicycles. People are finding other means of transportation. And so we're trying to see if we can accommodate all of it, but we are very, very focused on having a public transportation system that function and, and works. And uh, we'll get some help, hopefully, from, from the federal government. We're working very closely with Congresswoman Rice to see if that can happen. But uh, we're optimistic that, you know, New York, we've always had problems in the past, whether it's 9-11 or recessions, 
We've always come back stronger. This time won't be any different. And so uh, I guarantee you we'll, we'll make it happen. Thank you, Bill. And, and you know, Suzanne, I'm on the Homeland Security Sorry. Committee. So we have been talking very closely with the airlines and TSA because a critical component to the economic recovery of this country and the rest of the world is increasing, is, is making, giving people the confidence that it's okay and safe to travel. There are so many service oriented businesses that rely on people traveling. New York City, the revenue that we have lost because people aren't, can't come here. So um, we're working very closely with the airlines to, you know, every time I've flown, mask, social distance on the plane, if you can, um, working with hotels to make sure that they go through a cleaning regimen that gives travelers the ability to feel comfortable doing that. And, you know, improving the airport experience and touchless security and things like that. We're working very closely with companies like Clear um, together with the TSA because we're never going to work. I mean, look, what's the future of travel going to be like? It's too early to tell. But one way that we can get the economy going is by making people feel confident that it's okay to travel. Thank you very much. I think we're, run, we're running uh, rapidly out of time, but if I have time for one more question, I would go back to Belfast and ask Pete, look, um, the stores and retail have started to, to reopen. Um, how is this, this going to happen for you? What inspiration are you drawing from other cities? And, and, and New York and New Belfast is one way we can strengthen our bonds, is looking at what each other's doing. Can you comment on that? Um, Pete. Uh, yes, sorry, yes. I just missed the question. But um, yes, we're, 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 uh, we're, we're watching everything that's going on all around us. So uh, obviously, we're part of different retail organizations and we have uh, stores yeah. both in the UK, all over the UK and Ireland. So we're really uh, reaching out and we're obviously in the jewelry sector. So we're reaching out through all the jewelry industry all over the world and getting uh, feedback from even from Korea and and places like that about how best. I mean, we're in very close contact and, and, it, and really controlling this virus isn't that, uh, it's pretty straightforward. You must decrease the contact and the touch surfaces and, and cleanliness. And so we will be overly cautious to start with and, and as we feel, as everybody has learned, I think at the start of this, when, when, we, um, when the virus hit, uh, we, we were happy really to get the stores closed. We actually closed before the, the government instructions told us to because mm -hmm. we just didn't feel comfortable for our staff or our thing. But mm -hmm. as everybody has learned a little bit more about it and we, we're beginning to get uh, find our feet, we feel that we can uh, put, we've learned so much about what, how to behave, our customers have learned how to behave. I mean, I was saying earlier this morning when we opened, the reality is we're in this together, our staff and our customers. Our staff are dependent on our customers and behaving in a mature and uh, responsible manner when they're visiting the stores. And then our, our staff have their processes to follow. But it is a partnership together, the two of us, both our customers and our staff. And so, yes, we'll, we'll get learnings from, from anywhere we can, anywhere it's already open, and, uh, and we will definitely learn from that. Well... Well, thank you, Pete. And um, as an avid uh, shopper, I look forward to um, going into the stores, both in New York City here and, and both in Belfast. And I certainly look forward to that warm welcome from Gavin and Paul and Bill and Kathleen. I definitely look forward to getting back onto the subways and to going back and forth between New York City and Long Island. So thank you very much to all of my panellists. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you. I'm going to hand it back to Marching. Suzanne, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to your wonderful panel, in particular to Gavin Robinson for hosting us here today in the NAVAC headquarters in East Belfast. We hope to see our friends in New York sooner rather than.